So hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Now, I do recommend you go and watch part one if you haven't seen that, where we cover the different design philosophies between the hull shapes, the bow shapes, the level of foiling capabilities, and we did a quick comparison against the America's Cup boats. Now, towards the end of that video, we did sort of put into question the reliability of the new generation foils, which are absolutely massive, and how the hull and the whole boat ethos is designed around the new foils. And we did question the reliability and the fragility of those foils. And literally an hour after posting that video, we found out that the Chiral skipper, Jeremy Bayou, turned around for rudder and foil repairs all the way back to France. Apologies, Jeremy, I hope we didn't jinx you on that. Now, fast forward a few more days, we've had some more bad news in terms of breakages. Corum has dismasted somewhere near the Cape Verde Islands and it's race over for them. That was a very new boat hadn't had much testing. So why did Corum dismast in not too bad conditions and why haven't we really heard too much about it? Well, there's a bit of a dirty secret with all these latest generation of Mokers in that the mast has now become basically the fuse of the boat. Well, normally if your boat's overpowered, what might happen if the rig is strong enough, the boat heals over excessively, uh, loses power when it turns into wind and everything becomes safe and you keep your mast. The problem with these latest generation of mockers, and the data is out there, if you want to kind of find this dirty secret, is the rig, which is a one design rig which all the boats in the fleet have to use, is rated to about 33 tonne metres of load, and the fully foiling, fully canted heel, fully ballast, ballasted up hulls of these latest generation of mockers can produce over 43, 45 tonne metres of grip. So basically what that is, in layman's terms, is the mast can't take the grip or writing moment, the hull, when it's fully foiled, fully ballasted, is providing. And then the, basically the, the mast becomes uh, the weak link. And that just makes it extra stressful for the skippers because they can't cop a bit of sleep thinking, well, if it gets really bad, the boat's going to broach. Now, if it gets really bad and they're overpowered, they can lose the mast. And that has come from the one design class rule of these Amokas, that they all have to use the same rig, essentially. And some of the boats, that's fine for. So some of the older boats that can't produce that 43, 45 ton metres of writing moment uh, of hull stability of, or of hull grip, that'll be fine. They'll never be able to get into that situation where the hull is so grippy it'll overpower the mast. But the newer ones are, and that is a problem. And I think that's what's happened to Corum. I think, yes, add in a few composite, maybe uh, production flaws and a, and a few micro cracks somewhere or some fatigue, and if you're already working quite close to the safety factor of the rig and your hull can overpower the rig because it's got so much grip and so much writing moment from the massive foils. And don't forget the foils on that boat are very, the wingspan of the foils is big. So when you've got lift uh, on a, a further away from the hull, that writing torque is bigger because it's got a longer lever arm. So it's very kind of easy to see how these really modern hulls can overpower the rig, which probably is not rated high enough now for these hulls. That's my theory of what happened to Quorum. Anyway, getting back to part two, we're going to talk about aerodynamics. Uh, we couldn't fit it all in the first one. And from a kind of non-sailors point of view, I think this is quite a cool subject. So I think there's a lot of gains to be had that aren't being had. So it's quite interesting. Anyway, stay tuned for part two. So just a quick recap, if you're not familiar with the Vendee Globe Round the World Sailing Race, half it's in the title, it's a Round the World Sailing Race, but it's unassisted, it's solo. So the skippers are on their own. There's no outside help. The boats are violent in this year's race. They're more extreme than ever. They're fast and they're evil. Now, considering this race happens every four years and the teams have basically four years to plan and engineer their challenge, still only about half the boats finish. So that goes to show how hard it is. Skippers might get around 10 to 15 minutes of sleep every day in really tough passages. And probably in the first 48 hours, like we've just seen, they might not sleep at all, such as the adrenaline and rush to get going. Now the next topic I really want to get into is aerodynamics and this is something I think is forgotten so much in sailing. And for me, for someone who isn't a traditional sailor from the old school, it seems like to me there's just this huge basket, this huge treasure trove of low hanging fruit in terms of aerodynamics out there to be had. And they get more significant as the boat, the airspeed of the boat is, is increasing. And we see these boats going, you know, 30, even 40 knots now uh, in, in some conditions that the aerodynamics becomes seriously, seriously important because as you know, aerodynamic power goes up with the cube of the speed. So it becomes really important as the boat speed gets faster. And this is where aerodynamic gains need to start being looked at. And we see it a bit more on the America's Cup boats. Now, the first thing I wanna pick up about the aerodynamics is, is the heel angle. And like we mentioned about the foils and the kind of still compromised foiling principle of these boats, is that even when the boat speed is high through the water and the foil is giving maximum lift on the leeward side, we still see considerable heel angles. 
and I think it's got better for this generation, but in the last generation of boats, because you like even the Hugo Boss boat back in 2016-17 race, when that was really flying, Alex Thompson was sailing with an extreme heel angle, and that is really detrimental to wing efficiency for a number of reasons. Not only does it tip the perpendicular lift vector off the sail downwards, so now the lift vector has a vertical component pushing the boat down into the water, which has increased the hull drag, it also creates a much more turbulent pocket of air on the working side, so on the leeward side of the sail where you've got your low pressure, high velocity air uh, fl trying to flow over the sail. If you've got an extreme heel angle and you've got all that wake of the turbulent air that hasn't attached itself to the leeward side of the hull coming around those bottom portions of the sail, you lose a lot of sail performance off the maybe the first third or the first, even the first half, the head sail and the main sail from having it too close to the sea surface and being too close to all the turbulent, unattached, separated air that's not been able to keep attached around the hull. When you really push a boat too far on the heel, if you see this, the bottom of the sail start to flap, you can tell that the air separated and all that area of the sail, you're not getting any lift from that. So you're, you're basically slowing yourself down. And you might think, you know, if you're not, if you're not into sailing, you might think, oh, the, the, the more heeled the boat is, the faster it's going, or it looks faster. But quite often, if you put a reef in and have the boat more upright, you're going to go faster. And you see it with the America's cut, cut boats, they're basically a zero heel angle and the sails work amazingly because there's no downward component of the lift vector. Now the heel angle problem and the hull shape aerodynamically are further interlinked in a bad way in that when the boat is heeling and flying on the foils, the frontal area and coefficient of drag of the exposed hull to the wind is, is pretty bad. It's a pretty awful aerodynamic shape and, and a, a huge frontal area. We're like, let's look at the picture of Chiral flying. The whole hull is out of the water. It, the heel angle is pretty big and there's a massive, massive uh, frontal area of wind there. And the coefficient of drag of that shape can be pretty bad because essentially on the other side, on the deck side or the coach roof side, it's pretty flat. So the air is gonna have a real trouble staying attached as it flows over that hull. Now let's not forget, it may look very stream, the hull may look very streamlined to the front and it is in the water direction. But the air direction, the apparent wind angle, is not the water direction. The air will never hit that bow at zero degrees. The air will always hit that bow at, at least 30 degrees. Because the apparent wind angle, it can't sail into wind, so the apparently, apparent wind angle, or what we call the yaw angle in aerodynamics, is going to be at least 30 degrees. Okay, maybe a little bit less when the boat's really going hard. But let's say it's going to be greater than 30 degrees of yaw, so basically a crosswind. Do you think the air is going to stay attached to that shape and try and flow over it in a nice, unturbulent manner when it goes to the other side? Absolutely not. Now the hull aerodynamics, not only does it produce parasitic drag on the leeward side, literally sucking the hull that way, all that separated turbulent air that's come off the hull is going to affect the lower portions of the cell, so you're going to lose cell performance there. And this is why we see in the America's Cup boats, they've spent a lot of, they put a lot of work into reducing the frontal area of the apparent wind when it hits the boat, and they've really worked on the aerodynamics work. So keeping the air attached to the hull is key. Now whether they do like some clever things like a vortex generation just below the tow rails of the hull and some clever shapes to help keep the to help trip the air to turbulent boundary layer and keep that air attached to the hull longer as it goes over when when the hull is out of the water flying and reducing the parasitic drag on the on the leeward side why aren't they doing those sort of things? I haven't seen any of those obvious features put in. Another one like you see on the America's Cup boats, which I really like on the L'Occitane boat again, is the softer bow shape. The air's got more chance to flow around the soft bow and the curved bow than it has on that sharp leading edge. If, you, if you're expecting the, the air to flow around that sharp leading edge on the wave piercing designs, it just won't. I mean, the, co the coefficient of drag of a flat plate, which is basically what that is, is a dart on the air's coming like this. It's not gonna, it's not gonna stay attached as it goes around that leading edge, sharp leading edge of the bow. The Loxatan boat and the America's Cup boat's got a much softer bow. The air is going to stay attached for longer. It's still going to separate, but it's going to stay attached for longer, and the resulting amount of parasitic drag is going to be less. Another one, and this could even be implemented on the older Imokas, bring the boom down. Why is the boom sticking so far up out the coach roof? It's so far above the coach roof. There's nothing to prevent the high and low pressure air on each side of the wing uh, mixing and creating a big vortex which will spiral off the back of the boom and it's obviously invisible, you can't see it happening, but you're gonna lose sail performance by not separating those high and low pressure sides. I mean, you see it, you see it in most sport, you see it in planes, you see winglets on the end of wings to keep the air separated, reduce the size of that uh, tip vortex, which will slow the boat down. And not only will it slow the boat down through parasitic drag, it will, you'll lose uh, sail performance, you'll lose your lift to drag ratio 
and it's something that quite easily could be done. Bring the boom down and have it sweeping the coach roof. Why don't they put a some sort of like brush or membrane, some flexible membrane or brush between the bottom of the boom and the co coach roof to sort of separate the high and low pressure sides and you'll get more lift off the bottom portion of the sail if you do that. And again, it's a very low risk, minimal impact on safety, minimal impact on reliability to do that. And you saw it even in, you know, it was the old F1 car where they had skirts and this, I think it was a ground effect car and they were trying to, you know, separate the, the pressures, but they had a, a skirt, basically a, a brush system or a skirt that would separate the high and low pressure air to a certain extent to increase, increase the performance. Um, you could quite easily implement that on a boom with a with a flexible membrane between the boom and the coach roof as the boom you know moves on the traveller from left to right it still kept the high and low pressure air on two sides of the sail separate why don't we do that now another one that really bugs me is the outrigger poles um, okay so this is a this is a one design aspect of the Amoka class is that actually all the boats have a common outrigger design and the outriggers are the poles which hold the shrouds very wide off the hull and give the shrouds a larger opportunity to have a horizontal force component in the horizontal directions to basically give the mast more more bending stiffness or more bending rigidity. So by getting those out really wide, it creates a stiffer rig. Now those poles are around 100 mil in diameter, uh, about three meters long, and there's one on each side, and they're round. And round cylinders are notoriously bad for aerodynamics. Quite high coefficient of drag, probably like 0.5 for a round sphere and they're pretty big you know they've got a considerable diameter obviously they need a diameter and they're composite to take the buckling loads of the shrouds which are very heavily tensioned all the lines that are on the end on the end of those outriggers are very under high tension so yes it's a buckling member um it's not taking much bending they're you know they're pin jointed at, at the ends the lines so they're in shackles on bearings and pulleys so they're mainly in compression so it's quite an easy thing to design but why have them round because round slows you down why not air why not why not have an air force section as that buckling member you know like just like in an f1 car you see the front suspension struts are air force shaped and i would say the loads on those and the different load cases are considerably more complex than the the outrigger poles on these boats which are largely in compression okay it's not going to make one team have an advantage over another team because this is the one design aspect of the class like they all have to use the same kit but when you're talking about engineering feats and feats of endurance and like record breaking stuff like why not use the best solution possible? Why not, you know, humans are all about embetterment and evolution. Um, so why not just do it? Because it's a simple thing to implement. Anyone with a half a degree in like uh, structural mechanics could could design you an airfoil shaped uh, outrigger pole. And again, things like uh, on deck, the stanchions. So the stanchions are the little uh, handrail poles basically on the on the side of the hull, on the, on the edge of the deck, all around the boat, which hold the little like, you know guardrails which you can clip your fenders onto and you know you can hold onto when you're on on the bow you know changing sails and stuff but generally the sailors don't clip onto those with their harnesses because generally in sailing they're not structural they're just you know they're there to sort of hold if you need to and you can you know tie your fenders off them on when you're on the key side but they're not structural and there are other places which the sailors normally clip the harnesses onto when they're going forward to do sail changes on the bow and again, back to the outrigger poles, most of those stanchions, even on the very latest generation boats, they're all round. They're cylinders, and cylinders are notoriously bad for parasitic drag in, in aerodynamics. So why do we still have the stanchions on the boats when the skipper is not doing sail changes? And they're probably 99.9% .9 of the time, they're just out there in the high apparent wind speed and causing drag. And the skipper's they don't really need them. And we don't see them on the America's Cup boat, they got rid of them. And yes, okay, when the skipper goes onto the bow to do a sail change, let's put something on the deck where they can clip onto, but I guarantee they're not gonna be using the handrails that much. And I've just done a quick, again, back of the fag packet calculation. So, and there are other things that cause causing a load of air drag on the decks, like lazy jack lines and all the other you know, various lines that kind of don't need to be there. And even with the stanchions, okay, let's say you want the stanchions to be there, why not have them retractable? So when the skipper needs to go out to do a sail change and he wants that security of having the stanchions and the guardrails around the hull, from the cockpit, pulls a the line, they pop up, they're on a, a locking cam, they pop up and they stay there until he goes back, releases the jammer and they fall down again. Pretty simple to engineer, I'll do that for you if you really want. But anyway, let's find out at what boat speed do we use? So we, no, sorry, not boat speed, because we're not talking about boat speed anymore, we're talking about wind speed, we're talking about air speed. 
So with an airspeed of, again, 10 meters per second, round number, about 22 knots of airspeed, um, calculated about 0.8 meters squared for the outrigger poles and about 0.6 meters squared for the, let's say there's 20 stanchions, uh, 30 mil diameter. And that's taking into account that the outrigger poles um, won't have the wind coming at their worst direction. So actually, yes, if you're getting really into this, because of the apparent wind angle and the, and the angle of the outrigger poles, when the wind hits them, they won't actually be hitting the cylinder, they'll be hitting more of an ellipse shape. But anyway, I've taken that into account in, in, the, in the calculations, which I've done here. So for the outriggers, 10 meters per second, uh, density of air, 1.2 kilograms per meters cubed. I've put the air in, coefficient of drag of the cylinder is about 0.5, which is common for both. Um, at 10 meters per second, you need 240 watts to move those two outrigger poles through the air at 10 meters per second, 240 watts and about 180 watts for the same uh, wind speed for the stanchions. Now, if you combine that together, that's nearly a horsepower. So by not having those, well, okay, let's do it like this. By having those two things on the boat, when the boat's doing a, whatever hull speed, but when the boat's in 22 knots of wind, or apparent wind, that's like having an outboard on the bow one, one, a one horsepower output on the bow trying to push it back the other way. If you could gain that for free, that one horsepower, and not have that outboard pushing you back the other way, wouldn't you do it? Of course you would. And they're just in the wind. Why do we still see them? Why don't we have them retractable, or at least make them aerofoil shaped, or morphing aerofoil, like a wind vane. Let's, let's, have, a, let's have an aerodynamic fairing on them, which sets itself at zero degrees to the apparent wind angle. You know, and have the coefficient drag down at 0 0.05, instead of 0.5 for a cylinder. And this, you know, these kind of aerodynamic shrouds could go onto the, the furling head sails. You know, you've got, so let's say you've got three furled sails on the, on the front of the boat. Um, they could have aerodynamic shrouds around them which were self-setting to the apparent wind angle, just like a weather vane. Um, reduce those cylindrical coefficient of drags from 0.5 down to 0 0.05, something like that. So there are a lot of gains to be had. Another one, um, lazy jack lines and sail bag, again, Unless shit really hits the fan, how often does the sail bag get used when the race is on? Well, it doesn't. Okay, so the, the, the lazy jack lines prevent the sail from you know, snagging. It helps the sail be dropped, and maybe it helps the sail be dropped even when you're reefing, which you do need to do quite a lot. You do need to move the sail area or adjust the sail area up and down quite a lot. But the sail bag and the lazy jack lines, for 99.99% of the time, aren't doing anything. But you see racing boats, with high performance sails, with seriously expensive rigs, carbon mast, moving carbon mast to keep the air attached, that's the whole point of the moving carbon mast is to you know, increase the efficiency of the, of the sail. And then, I don't know how much they spend on these, te on these textured fabrics and stiffening fabrics in the sails, but then on the last two foot of the bottom of the sail, you've got the fucking sail bag flapping around. And that sail bag is, essentially very close to the boundary layer of the air on the working sides of the sail and is interfering with the airflow on the sails. It's just flapping around. Why would you have that? It's a parasite. Why not after setting the sail? I mean, at least just you could unclip the sail bag from the lazy jack lines, tuck the sail bag and stow it somewhere in the boom or tie it to the boom or something like this, or even use that sail bag, take it under the boom and use that as the membrane, as the sealing membrane between the low high the low pressure and the high pressure air, like we talk about with the F1 car, use that as the membrane to seal the sides, seal the pressures. You know, you've got these seriously expensive multi-million euro boats, uh, custom bespoke composite boats, and then you sail around the world in a race and you've got the sail bag flapping open like you would on your 40 foot Bavaria in, you know, in the Mediterranean. It just it's, it doesn't make sense. It's like um, it's like Lewis Hamilton driving his car around an F1 track with a he with a with a coat hook somewhere on the car. So before he gets into the car, he can hang his jacket up on the car. He's like, well, it's there for when I need it, but you don't need it when you're racing. So why why have it there? It's just like these little things that I bet if you ask the people that implement them and design them and say, well, why is that there? Why why haven't you done it somewhere else? And they go, well, when the answer is well, it's always been done like that. You know that it's wrong, and it's just traditionalism, and it, it needs to end. Because if we're talking high performance and record breaking, let's let's really make these things record breaking. 